all confused. Oh, I see. Okay, I think it's 701. So, I'm going to open the council meeting. Welcome, everybody. Judy, will you call the roll? I will call that very brief roll. McQueen? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Also present is Village Manager Patty Bates, Assistant Village Manager Melissa Dodd, Chief of Police Brian Carlson, and uh, we have two council members who are out of town or stuck in snowstorms. Uh, Judith Hempfling and Brian Hausch will not be present this evening. <coughs> also present, Village Solicitor Chris Conard. Okay, so now it's time for announcements, and our Chief Brian Carlson has an announcement to make. Uh, good, evening. good evening. Police Department is pleased to announce how excited we are that we have filled the position of Community Outreach Specialist. We are excited to report that Ms. Florence Randolph of Yellow Springs has been appointed to the position. Before I go any further, I'd like to, to say publicly a huge thank you to Kate Hamilton for her due diligence flexibility and patience in working with me and the village to make this happen. And a thank you to council, Patty, and everyone involved in the process. I'm really excited. I'd like to introduce to you Florence, longtime resident of Yellow Springs. Florence brings a wealth of knowledge uh, to the department she has a specific requirements and education to the position in addition to wealth of knowledge and social work and working within the justice system. Thank you very much. All right. Well, welcome, Florence. Yes, welcome. Do you want to say anything? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was part of the job description. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> she uh, lets you know she's leaving with the high school for um, Peru. And uh, she'll be starting here officially April 2nd. Great. So we've got a long journey ahead, but I'm real excited. I am too. Right. Thank you. Ready. Handshake again? Thank you. Handshake again. <laughs> Staged. Okay. Can you look at me, Floss? Look at me. Look at me. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Good deal. So this this is something that's been <coughs> Chief Carlson. When did do you remember when Ken Kate, uh, Kate first started talking about this? Was I believe it was a couple years ago. Yeah, well before me. <coughs> yeah. and so the wheels of justice, justice move slowly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. Other announcements. I have one announcement. I know uh, Patty Bates has some announcements. So this this is an announcement that I just read about today. Emily Fobert, who is our former mayor's uh, David Fobert's daughter, is doing which I think she's calling it, a bird language club, which I think sounds really interesting, at the Glen on Saturday mornings. And you can come starting at 9. It's from 9 to new, noon uh, at the Glen. I guess it's the Glen, either the Glen Helen building or the... It's Trailside. Pardon? It is in Trailside. Trailside. At Trailside. Yeah, that makes sense. But um, check it out. It sounds like a lot of fun. So, Patty. Okay, I have, as Marianne said, several announcements. Um, the first is that on March 20th, please expect brown water. Um, our new valve exercising machine is arriving and there will be doing training on that as well as flushing some of the lines um, in preparation for the new Cresco build uh, out at the uh, former Center for Business and Education. So we will have brown water on March the 20th. Please be prepared. There will be um, gallons of drinking water available at the police department um, if you need those. Um, so, and we will continue to announce that and put it on Facebook as we and our website as we get a little closer. Um, we will have uh, tomorrow down in the lobby. We found um, 
several cases, um, and when I say several, I mean 11 uh, cases of these behind the stage. These were bought by the village some time ago, and while they are not LED lights uh, bulbs, they are energy efficient bulbs, and we will be putting these on a table in the lobby, and please help yourself to the number that you need, keeping in mind that there are probably a lot of people in the village who could use these. So those should be out tomorrow in the lobby of the Bryan Center. Um, and the last announcement that I have is that I would like to wish a belated happy birthday to our own Melissa Dodd. Cool. <laughs> happy birthday. Yeah. Happy Thank birthday. You. That it? That's it? Do <coughs> either of the other council members have announcements? I do not. Okay. Then we are going to uh, move on to the minutes uh, of our last meeting. February 20th. So do I have, are there any corrections before we move to approve them? So do I have a motion to approve the minutes from I February? move to approve the minutes. And I second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, now we are moving on to petitions and communications. So I'm going to go over those. We had several. In this case, I think it was about six. Um, we had a communication from Pam Nicodemus, which had attached a number of other citizens uh, who would want to make sure that Village Council reviews uh, affordability in terms of utilities, which we actually have on our list of things to do. And next announcement, is that 365 is celebrating their 10th anniversary. That celebration is Sunday, March 18th, starting at 245 at Central Chapel. And there are various, uh, various things that will be happening during their, that celebration. So that sounds like a great thing to do. Uh, our Village goals are online and available in hard copy for citizens to rank. And I know that they're available, hard copy at Tom's. Um, Tom's, Dino's, the Senior Center in the Emporium, and the library. They're out in five different places. Okay, and online on our they're, Facebook? They're on Facebook, and you can also access the link uh, through our website homepage. Okay. Can people, uh, are they supposed to just check off all the ones they think are important or rank order them or what? Um, they are supposed to check the ones um, that are important and then you can make additional comments on the back of the card. Okay, great. So this is our, this is our first attempt like this to reach out into the community to actually get some feedback on our goals. Mm -hmm. So I encourage citizens to do that. It's also on Facebook, right? Did you say it's, that? Yes, it's on yeah. Facebook and, and on our, our, our website yeah. homepage. We also received from the clerk information regarding the referendum from 2002 about housing on the glass farm. And um, I don't know that I need to mention it now, but maybe when we talk about, when I talk about the housing, when we go over housing, I'll, I'll bring that up. Lastly, we have an article that appeared in the um, Ohio Managed, what is it, Ohio Manager Journal of Ohio Managed? Cities and Villages. City, oh, it's in Cities and Villages. Cities and Villages regarding the uh, statue monument that John Hudson of Yellow Springs made for Dayton, and it's to honor civil servants. And so that there's an article about John, about the purpose of the, of the, statue and uh, some pictures of him, the statue, and uh, the Mayor Nan Whaley unveiling it. And it's by the new library. So it looks like a very cool thing. Richard, you've probably already been there to see it. That yeah. Beautiful. Okay. That oh, takes it. I'm sorry. I did have one other oh. announcement, but it's on a different piece of paper, and so I okay. completely forgot about it. Um, I would like to announce that our own Johnny Burns is once again being recognized this, by, this time by Greene County. 
um, at the, um, the Greene County Board of Commissioners and Greene County Community Improvement Corporation breakfast, uh, their annual report to the community, and he will be recognized again for his seven hats and his contributions to uh, public service and, and our own village of Yellow Springs. Good. Go down. Great. Good. Now we move on. Uh, oh, you have something. In the, in, the, in the spirit of backing up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> with respect to uh, reviewing the agenda, I'd like to add um, one item to the oh, new I'm business. Sorry. I want to nominate someone for Let's HRC. Yeah. Okay. okay, so when do you want to do that? Under new? New business. New business. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I also have some someone. I, I can actually make two nominations. Okay. Great. So, yes, I skipped review of the agenda. So, okay. now, now we move to public hearings and legislation. However, we're, we aren't actually going to do it because this particular piece of legislation requires a supermajority which we do not have because we're missing two of our council members. So what we are going to do, and I guess Chris will tell us what the legislation is about, but what we're going to do is move that vote to our special meeting on the 13th. That's right, and I just wanted to make sure that that was reflected in the minutes. Um, this has to do with follow-up to the uh, preliminary ruling that the judge in Franklin County issued in House Bill 49, which denied the city's uh, attack on the uh, legislation uh, pertaining to the profit tax. Um, and he rejected the claims of Rita and another group of um, municipalities that have banded together. Uh, no strategy has been forthcoming yet from uh, Rita's council on what's going to happen next. They would have 30 days to uh, appeal the decision, so we're within that period of time. I have a quick question even though we're not going to go forward tonight. I mean, it seems like a necessary maneuver, but I think that the citizens who watch this meeting and listen may not be reading quite all of this text. So is there is there anything that you think a citizen should know about this? You know, the impact on them or? Well, it, it's not it, it, the, the part of the legislation that's being challenged has to do with it. A business tax that doesn't have anything to do with an individual uh, income tax. It has to do with who collects the taxes for businesses and whether or not a business opts in to have Columbus do it or if they do it locally. Uh, the concern by municipalities is, is that um, finance directors in most communities know their communities pretty well and they uh, take a look at tax returns and they've got a pretty good idea of who's paying what and what's right. Um, and the belief is that if you centralize that task in Columbus, that you're going to lose that local control because they won't dig into uh, what's going on in terms of those taxes being paid. And, and Chris, is it not true that the state is going to levy a 5% surcharge for doing that collection? Correct. There will be a 5% administrative fee for that service. Thanks. Thank you. Now, oh, and I'll just say, so council is having a special meeting on the 13th for the purpose of uh, working on our goals. So that's a, what, Thursday? Tuesday. 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 Next Tuesday. And that will be in this room. And, of course, the public is invited. And, and I guess what I'd like to reiterate, uh, we just did talk about the you know, the Facebook page, uh, the, the Villages page, and the um, survey cards that are out there. So I just want to reiterate the importance uh, to the public to let us know what you think uh, about those goals as they exist. Um, the whole exercise is to not have us doing all of this in a vacuum. So it's important that we get some feedback uh, so that we can indeed feel that we have heard from the public um, as we move forward. Okay. Now we move um, to citizens' concern. This is a time in the council meeting when anyone who has something that they would like to share with council or questions or concerns that are not on the agenda um, and people have about three minutes. So if you'd like to say something, you can come up to the podium 
right there. Say your name and go for it. Uh, Joel Goldberg. Uh, we were under the impression that tonight was the induction of the new mayor. Oh, mm. Joel, the new mayor was sworn in uh, a month ago. Yeah. Oh, okay, she's not here, so <laughs> she's not on the agenda. No, yeah. she's been very busy, though. <laughs> thank, thank you for coming, but you're welcome to stay for. <laughs> Can, can, can you hear us when on television? Usually, yeah. Oh, hmm. good. All right, we're good. So well, we'll make sure Pam know you stopped by. Okay. Hi, how are you? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Does anyone else have something they'd like to say? Good evening. Good evening. Hey, I'm Kelly Gray. Uh, just brought this up. I'm going to bring this up to the school council too. Uh, just because of all the things in the air, uh, what's going on with the school shooting and whatnot. And I kind of felt like, you know, we're a progressive community and we're doing all these different things, we're bringing different kind of things to the community and whatnot. And I know in the past, you know, uh, obviously, with the guns and everything, there's there's a lot of issues to be solved with that. But I guess my point is to not even worry about that. Is kind of like uh, my concern is is having a, a, a plan of action to kind of prevent any of those things from entering the school grounds. Mm. I currently have three children that are in the school systems, mm -hmm. and the way it's going, uh, with the way things are going, the uh, I kind of feel like we need to be on guard as a community. Could, could I? Yes. Um, yeah, the chief and I actually talked a little bit about this, um, uh, and we talked about it at our staff meeting last week. And and we do have plans to meet with um, uh, Superintendent Basoro, mm -hmm. and and talk to him a little bit about this. So right. we, you know, we we share your concerns and we understand them. So we right. we're going to look at working with the schools on that. Sure. And uh, okay. Sergeant Watson, did you have anything that you wanted to? Other than the fact that. Um, that someone is always in that area. Sure. Um, sometimes we're in uniform, sometimes we're not. Sure. When the kids are going to school, you try to have someone there when the kids are getting out of school, but you know, sometimes it just depends on what they right. want to staff sure. and if we're on other calls. Sure. But we too are well aware and we are working oh, sure. um, forward with training, yeah. um, not okay. only training with our officers, but training with the schools. Right. And, um, Different plans and sure, like that. sure, and, I, and that's why I'm bringing it up as a, as a concerned citizen. I'd like to Thank see you. some kind of plan come through because I've already researched it. You can get the. I know this sounds outlandish to most people because, like I say, privacy issues come into play. Mm -hmm. I even price metal detectors, 33 point metal detectors that are put us, mm -hmm. you know, give you an idea of what you know, and they're, and they're not an X-ray, so they're not invasive of, of that. They're simply a metal detector. Also, just having like she said, police presence on the grounds or a security measure on the ground. Mm -hmm. That way, at least, it's, it's like a deterrent. It's almost like, okay, well, we see it, not like sometimes or once in a while on the street corner, <coughs> but they actually see and say, well, we know there's gonna be constant some kind of something in play. And I think the village can afford that as a long-term plan because obviously these kind of things are recurring mm -hmm. more and more. Well, they, it, it would be up to the school whether they wanted to allow right. that or not. Correctly. But I just kind of figured as a community to bring it up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, with all the extra funding, and like I say, with, we're that progressive. I mean, it's a, I think it's a really good topic. I've lost two friends from high school here in this town to gun violence. Paul Shane and Skip Brown. Uh, mm -hmm. There's been countless other events in town. And so that's, that's why we're in this. I, I'm not a gun owner. I never want to be a gun owner. I truthfully might think I wish there was never any kind of weapons of any sort. <laughs> but unfortunately, there are, and there's a lot of work. But as, as like I'm saying, just to have something to, to stand in the way of that, mm -hmm. of that kind of thing happening, with the kind of spur of the moment, yeah. quick judgment, going to solve things in a hurry with the gun kind of things that are going on in this country. And uh, I, think, I think it kind of calls Thank you. I think it truly does. Yeah, I, I mean, think I really, that... It, I really, like I said, research, I'd be, even be willing to put my own funding, if it comes to this kind of funding thing, when I know the village can afford it, we already have enough running fire department. We're getting all brand new ones. Mm -hmm. 
So, but we don't really have a measure of true security installed mm -hmm. in the schools at all, any true measures. Mm -hmm. So I think it's great that you're going to speak with the, yeah. with people from the school board. I know we have a representative in a way up here, but um, I, I was at an event where they talked about the new school building and there's intention. Mm -hmm. They're openly talking about this in the sessions right. and the architectural design right. is to promoting exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I think that you'll find a very open, you know, yes. open to this issue. Right. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank like you. I said, if it comes to funding, I know that the village has done very well at, at uh, creating revenue, extra revenue, you know, we've been bragging about it quite well. Uh, <laughs> and like I said, those machines are $3,500 a piece. I'd be willing to buy the first one to get a match. That's what I'm saying. That's where I'm going with it. I'm not serious about it. I'm not like, well, we got to vote this in. we got to wait for six months. I'm saying, like, yeah. we can afford yeah. it. Well, it yeah. I, or, I, or basically, just try it all. Uh, yeah, again, that would be a school school yeah, board sure. decision sure. whether those went sure. into the. Kind of but I do think it makes sense. For, this is an less, example of the village government and the schools to the work together. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. okay. Thanks for Thank coming. You. I appreciate Thank you. it. Um, I think Naomi would like to say something. Something I want to reiterate is sure. for parents out there, the biggest thing is if you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. If you see something suspicious, um, you know, make sure you call us, let us know. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the biggest things I've heard a lot of parents say, well, you know, after things happen, well, I saw that, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not sure, yeah. definitely call the police department. And, we'll send someone out and the same thing for the students. They should Absolutely. report it to an adult. Yeah. Thank you. Special reports, I think we have none. Correct. Old business. So I asked uh, Judy to uh, start the discussion about the board and commission documents because I had asked her to put them all together. So I thought it made sense for her to do that. So. Well, there are an awful lot of these, and the idea here was to, to try to condense a little bit. Um, so one of the things that I did was to take the longer piece that lists all of the uh, public service values, and rather than having border commission members promise to abide by all of those public service values, some of which are as specific as coming to meetings prepared, agreeing to always be truthful. I, I think some of those things can be to some extent assumed um, and don't need to be sworn to. So I, I really just parsed out those things that seem most critical and included those in the, the um, document that board and commission members would actually sign and say, yes, these are things that I agree to do. The other document would, would be provided as a best practice, um, but not something that they're saying, yes, I absolutely swear that I will always be prepared for every meeting because we all know how that goes. Um, there's one other document. You had some comments from Judith that she wanted some changes made. I made them and put that next to your spot, there was nothing major there that was under the guidelines for members of boards or commissions of council. So that was edited down a bit. So basically, that's where we are. I whacked away at it, made it much less wordy, and this is what you're left with. All yours. Well, thank you. So this has been sort of an ongoing saga for a year or so of as things come up with commissions, we go, oh, well, maybe we should say this. <clears throat> so right now what we have is the document, the main document that Judy was referring to that, that uh, commission members can sign, well, that we want them to sign. And then there's also the other document that is said guidelines for members of boards and commissions which has some more detail to it. And best practices, so that's three. And then the fourth page is what I guess Brian had want, still wanted included, which 
is what Judy was referring to that has a list of about 30 things that you should do or shouldn't do. So does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, at suggestions. Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's coming along. I was a little bit confused reviewing the <coughs> packet because th it seems like some of the documents kind of look the same. Yes. So I think it, there's maybe one more opportunity to look at what are the documents and are they all needed and you know. But I I, I didn't see anything in them that that what I found to be objectionable. What I couldn't find is um, at, at a couple of points along the way we've had a discussion about immediate family members or family family members on on commissions and between liaison and commissions and I couldn't find that in this document. Yeah. Well, you know that is uh, and that's your call but I think that the council liaison has control over whether or not that occurs such that it could be included only in the council best practices document. That is, if uh, Joe and his brother Charlie both apply for the same commission, you're doing those interviews, you're deciding who gets on the border commission, and you can simply say it's, it's our best practice not to appoint, therefore we'll select one of you or none of you, but we can't select both of you. So. What I'm saying is that could remain only in your bailiwick if you'd like, or I can replace it here. Just where would we put that? Where would it be written? I think, well, the, the piece I think it's, it's a little confusing is the best practices for commission and board members is a little more for once you're, once you're a board and in the commission, kind of what's the best way to be in this and turn in my things on a, in a timely fashion and communicate properly and, um, so I was going to say there, but that's actually where you exactly don't want it. Um, you know, it, one of the things I was know, maybe thinking. Should, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, I mean, maybe it should be there because it's there's that's the where it says council liaison should not serve as chair generally. Um, I I thought I saw a, a reference to that somewhere in one of these documents, but uh, yeah, at the last meeting, we mm -hmm. whatever copy we were working with then had it in there, whatever was presented initially. Well, and I don't recall if it was actually there or if it was a recommendation. It was a recommendation. In the last discussion of this. And, it, and I hadn't included mm -hmm. those as of yet. It wasn't entirely clear to me which you wanted ported over and which you mm -hmm. did not. So I wonder if, you know, here I am saying maybe there's too many documents, so here I am maybe recommending a new one. But I, I, I wonder if there is a, a, a very short preliminary uh, document that could even go on the website that's like, so, are you thinking about what, if you want to be on a commission? You know, this is what you should know. Um, more of an educational front end so that if someone sees the ad in the paper that we're looking for people or if they're interested in serving in this way, they would say, this is what we're looking for, this is who you probably shouldn't be, this is who you should be. Do you have to be a resident of the village? Do you have to not be a family member? How long are you serving? You know, that, that might be a place for it. I, I like that idea. I can certainly work on that, and then you folks can decide if it's too many documents, if it needs to be subsumed into something else, or whether that's a good standalone, because we don't have, we don't have a piece that says, if you're thinking about this, I usually just respond individually to each person and say, this is what that border commission is like. These are the things you're going to find out. Here's some documents. So I like that idea. I certainly can. So you that. would work yeah. on that. Mm -hmm. And would you also sort of put these together as they might appear, mm -hmm. like a little packet or booklet or something? And, and Judy, mm -hmm. I, I also like the idea of you, you know, taking some of the more detailed stuff and then boiling it down to the sort of the one. Pager actually is, is a two pager front and back uh, that a, a member would sign. But whereas even that piece does say see reverse exhibit A, um, I think if these other documents are going to remain live, that they should be named and identified and referred to. You know, so if you're going to boil it down, you're signing something. You don't have to carry around this big book of things, but you're signing something saying that I have read and understood these other things that are separate 
in, in more detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, and that's something that's not entirely clear to me f coming from council. There are items that you like to have as a council that are sent ahead of the interview so that during the interview you can make certain that do you have any issue with these things? Do you have any questions about these things? So, I mean, is that the practice that you want, that those are, are up front and discussed and then that's repeated in the document that they sign, which is fine. Um, I'm just making sure that that's the, what, you, what you want. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. The only one other question that I have, I, first of all, I want to preface it by saying, I've been so delighted by how many new commission members have rolled on since January 1st. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just been, I think there's like seven, eight, even more tonight or something like that. It's a lot. Um, and I was noticing the comment about training. And I know that some of the new commission members that I'm working with um, are feeling a little overwhelmed by all those videos that are part of that training and I know sunshine yeah right because I know from having recently completed it myself there's all these modules they force your march through it and only the last one I think is really pertinent to a commission member the rest all have to do with request for records and these people will never have to deal with that so I'm wondering what we think the timeline might be for training well well I'd like to address that specifically I, I only recently found out that the sunshine law re requirement is not a state requirement for commission members it's a council requirement and I don't think that all of the uh, ways that it applies to council necessarily need to apply to commission members mm -hmm. I don't want to keep spending hours and hours on this stuff because it's like detail stuff but um, I would like for us to agree on specifically what we expect of commission members in terms of the sunshine law and what's not expected. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm willing to work with one council member to come up with a, such a list and then I would like Judy to do the training. I mean we can, I mean it's not that detailed, it's mm -hmm. not that complicated really. It, it's really that last module mm -hmm. of the training. Yeah. Yeah. I just went through it, it uh, yeah. frighteningly fresh in my mind. So, I mean, I, I think it's really that final module that has to do with interaction and mm, not talking in the mm, privately, only having a certain number of people talk. There, I and mean, there are parts of it that are relevant, which are, that is, you are creating a document every time you email someone, that do document is subject to public records requests, mm -hmm. you need to know that and understand it as a part of your life that could become very miserable if you did not understand it fully the first time. That, that is relevant information that, you, that people really need to get hold of, but it's um, way too much information for someone who's on a border commission, I would agree with that, because you, you get the whole ball of wax rather than the kind of the particulars. Have you already started working on the tra uh, training that you have in mind, like what would be included? Oh, I, yeah, I mean, I have done them before for, for different boards and commissions have done them with individuals. So yeah, that's not a, that's not a problem. I, I mean, maybe we could come up with just a quarterly, um, do one every three months mm -hmm. on three different days of that week so that people can find a time they can come. I mean, I'm, I'm open to whatever works for your folks. Really, um, so. Would it work, Marianne, to, if, to kind of back into it through the training? So in other words, Judy could bring like an outline of what would be covered in the training and and then we might say, yeah, that looks great, or, you know, we don't really need that, or a little more of this. You know, is that a way to do it quickly? I'm going to push you around on that one, right. because okay. I, I'm going to tell you that there are things that you need to know that yeah. I, okay. I, I well, we can yeah, so, push so really, back. Because you're the expert. Right, and so I think whatever, whatever Judy uh, puts together is right, and, and she is right. There are things, there is a lot said, you know, about records requests, you know, but you cannot dismiss it completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it still needs to be covered. So it is not actually just the last module. You know, so there are stuff in all those previous modules that needs to be covered. But I think I trust Judy's ability to boil it down to something manageable. Okay. So, just a minute. Please, please, you have not been recognized. <laughs> um, so let's regroup here. So we're asking Judy to take these 
documents that she's just given us and <laughs> do them all over again. Yes, happily. <laughs> no. put, put them put them together so it's a cohesive unit. Identify which ones we would be sending to people when they apply. Also have a not, not it's not a cover letter, but something that could go on the website or something that's easily available to people when they're interested in applying. Short sure, FAQ. Yeah, and also uh, an outline of a training module. Okay. And when would it make sense to, for in terms of your schedule, to come? Oh, back? it could come back on the nineteenth. The next There's regular council meeting. To. Okay. All right. Uh, are we finished with this? Yeah. Okay. The next uh, thing we're going to talk about under old business is utility roundup and Lisa. Yeah. So um, I, I brought a, um, a report to council that um, summarizes um, some guiding principles and goals and then the beginning of an action plan. And I, I want to preface this report um, you know, by saying the guiding principles focus on affordability um, being the number one focus for the council and that the council is dedicated to taking action. But I, I also want to acknowledge that um, a heavy, a, a major part of this depends on a financial analysis that takes into account the debt that we carry on our systems and the directives from the EPA that aren't going to go away that we upgrade our water distribution system and the improvements that are necessary to other systems and an anticipated likely need that we'll need to have a third electric circuit. So mm, mm, what I um, think is needed, and I hope that this report reflects that, um, is a, a balance between an ambitious drive to increase affordability by understanding what's possible, um, particularly with the cost of electric, but also really understanding that we have to be fiscally responsible and just because we've had a positive financial report recently, um, it's just like our own household budgets where sometimes it seems like we have a bunch of money in the bank but we know we're going to need a new roof. So you can't just say, hey, let's you know, change everything. So I just really want to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge um, you know, the importance of, of collaboration with um, the, the village staff because we're going to need to do a fair amount of financial analysis that's going to uh, take up time. So thank you in advance for that. So, um, you know, I'm recommending this two-prong approach. I worked on this with Marianne. I also want to say that where on one hand we're taking action as quickly as possible to understand and address affordability of utilities, um, but then we're also trying to move forward with some kind of a, a utility relief program like a Roundup program. One of the things we've been hearing uh, from uh, community members and, uh, uh, and others uh, is that there may be other options, not necessarily a Roundup program, that achieves the same goal of creating a safety net for citizens. But I think we just started calling it a Roundup program, you know, something to help people that are struggling with their utilities. We just started calling it a Roundup program. But a Roundup program doesn't mean that that's the only mechanism that might be helpful. So. Um, on this document, there's four goals to analyze financial models, to evaluate utility rates and financial implications for the village. So what that means um, is to look at the um, amounts of money that are in reserves and consider how much revenue would we get from different programs like a Roundup uh, program and would that be enough revenue 
to help in a meaningful way, you know, what are the kind of two sides of the balance sheet to understand if, uh, you know, what we should best implement. Um, to identify rate structure revisions that may impact affordability in Yellow Springs. There are some good ideas out there that we might consider that would affect affordability in addition to having a utility roundup program or something else like that. And then a fourth item, and I've had some really good feedback from community members about this already, is the importance of identifying education and outreach programs in collaboration with um, 501c3s and other individuals who are very interested in utility, consumption, and effective practices. So they might lead educational efforts that would help people to make better use of, you know, don't waste water, don't waste power, that sort of thing. So um, I, <laughs> I'm going to, without, without, I know that you're the liaison to the HRC, so let me acknowledge that you and I haven't discussed this, um, but it's my understanding that uh, the Human Relations Commission has indicated a significant interest in affordability in general, and more specifically in understanding what might be possible with a, a Roundup program, and whereas at the same time as that initiative would go forward, there would need to be um, significant analysis. I'm recommending that the council ask the HRC to get actively involved in this as sort of two different projects. Um, the first one, utility affordability, uh, would be primarily um, initially a finance committee action, and I'm putting the cart before the horse a little bit, because the finance committee is later in the agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm making an assumption that there is some kind of body, um, a committee or an advisory committee looking at finance, but that the finance committee take on the financial analysis side of it, working with the village staff, and then the HRC get involved with figuring out how to engage 501c3 organizations, and then how a Roundup program might best be designed and administered. That gets a lot of people working on it, but it is a top priority for the community and for the council. So that's how I'm um, sort of proposing it. You see there is a pretty aggressive timeline um, that gets us going on the financial analysis um, between now and May um, with reports in June and an action plan in July that's based on data and the recommendations of the HRC. So that's not suggesting that the Roundup program will be live by July, but that there will be enough analysis and the HRC would have had sufficient time to consider um, the possibility between now and July. So I'm gonna stop for a minute, let you talk. I, I, before, mm -hmm. Kevin, I just wanna do a process thing. Um, it, are you seeing this as part of the uh, goal, the affordability goal, and that we will be talking about it on the 13th? Well, I do. I mean, one of the sub goals, you know, there's this in our goal, in the village goals, affordability is one, and a sub goal, at least as the document sits right now, is that there is some kind of a roundup program. I mean, that's in a goal right I'm, now. I'm just bringing this up because if we're going to talk about it on the 13th, mm -hmm. then. We don't have to totally flesh it out. Flesh it out. That's true. I guess what I'm saying is it's the goal and maybe one up, one up being the goal um, it, to say that I think that the um, financial models have to be considered um, and that just a roundup program isn't enough. I think that we really need to sharpen our pencils and think about is it possible to reduce rates or if not restructure the rates to increase affordability, and that's over and above the the Roundup program. Right. Okay. I mean, and and we, you and I have talked about yes. what Don Hollister suggested, what's called a lifeline or something, where the first rate uh, is is lower. And then mm -hmm. Ellis Jacobs has sent us a, mm -hmm. several pieces of information about options. So, mm -hmm. but I'm going to Kevin. Did you want to respond to? Yes. Well, thank you for thinking of the Human Relations Commission. We, uh, 
like having our name out there. Um, so, but I guess I would have questions in terms of um, the order of events with respect to um, the, the results of the financial analysis. Um, you know, I'm not saying that, that researching um, around it would be a waste of time, uh, but I'd like to make sure that we have the solid financial analysis to suggest the direction that we want to go in the first place, whether it's Roundup or some of these other ideas that have been um, suggested. Um, and so, so I think that being the case and that there are other things, I think we ought to, if, if Roundup, and we all know what that means, that's a, that is a specific strategy. Uh -huh. If that is just one of several potential strategies, I think we need to stop calling the big picture Roundup, Roundup yeah. and call it something and suggest uh, that that would suggest that that's one thing that we're looking at and I think we need to get more information about all of these other things um, under or after the uh, financial analysis before we dig mm -hmm. any deeper on, on one thing or another. So uh, in short, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to only slightly suggest that the HRC would be as excited about it as, as I am. Um, I believe they do want to move forward with this type of thing, so I, I think I'm, I'm certainly good with uh, the HRC uh, receiving this charge, uh, number one. But I do think we need a little bit more guidance in terms of you know, what the March orders are going to be after this financial analysis is done, and, and then what other strategies are we going to pursue or if you are asking us to pursue other strategies in addition to just the roundup, which I see is just one of, of a few. I, I think in my mind, um, uh, 1.3, so that's in this utility affordability, mm -hmm. um, the notion that the HRC might take an active role to identify individuals and 501c3 organizations to share a focus on utility affordability education and action. Um, it is not a dependency to the financial analysis okay. because I think there are people that you know in, in the village who are interested in certain things well, like I'm, that. I'm going to suggest that we start wrapping this up. Okay. And that the two of you can talk offline, especially around the financial mm -hmm. uh, aspects of this and how HRC might be involved. You could do that offline. I did want to say, in case people don't know, when we're talking about Roundup, what that means is that if, if the village does it, there will be a form that you'll have that you can say, I'm willing to have my utility bill rounded up to the nearest dollar. Or it could be $10 or I could make a donation so that the village can create a pot of money that would be given to some other institution to help people in, who have a, like a one-time need for utilities. That, that's what the Roundup program is. But there are other ways that we're investigating that Lisa has been discussing that we might be able to do some things with the utilities, um, uh, sort of mimic some of the programs that are out there uh, to help people, especially people who are having trouble with their utilities. Mm -hmm. So um, is there anyone in the uh, community that wants to say anything about this before we move on? David? I'll say something about the last thing I did too, since I didn't have a chance to talk about that. Where we're like moving on. About the council? Yeah. I can be, be brief on that one. Good. Uh, I wasn't quite sure where you were with the uh, Methodist in part. I'd say make it a rule or not. My sense is yes. we're we're we are, it's just where we include it. Okay, I would say put it in the uh, best practices for commission under, like somebody mentioned. As far as the documentation goes, Judy's done a great job the two times I've heard give the, the training, so I wish I could have heard you guys were saying. I see two attachment A's, I don't know which one is which. Yeah, and that, that that's part of what needs to get corrected so it's clear what's... Yeah, uh, anyway, so say, as far as housing goes, I. I like numbers and quantification. It's hard to understand what people are talking about here. I've gone through this. No, no, we're on utilities now. We haven't gotten to housing oh, yet. Got to housing. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, That's next. Come back soon. <laughs> so my same comment would apply to that one. I think that a definition, some kind of quantification of affordability is really valuable because yes. it means too mm -hmm. much and too little mm -hmm. to too many people. 
not just for housing or utilities, but for lots of things. Right. And how many people need how much affordable that's, what? That's exactly right. That's part of the analysis. We need more right. affordability. Wow. That right. says nothing. So. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. Good point. Thanks, Dave. Okay, we're going to move on to the housing initiative update. So the housing, the village manager's housing advisory board has been meeting and the, perp, the action that we're working on now is to have four community conversations in the community, four different times, four different locations in April. Each one will be the same information presented and it will be an opportunity for citizens to come to find out what uh, has been happening in terms of both our housing stock and uh, the trends, demographics, uh, uh, age, financial, diversity, and it'll be uh, time for people to be able to talk and give some feedback that'll come back to council. So I'm going to just say the dates and the places of the community conversations and we're, we will be getting the word out uh, as we're moving along later this month. But the first community conversation is going to be April 4th, which is a Wednesday, at Mills Lawn School at 7 p.m. The next day, on the 5th, Thursday, there will be a morning uh, meeting at the Senior Center at 10.30. Then the third community conversation on housing will happen on Monday, April 9th, at the First Baptist Church at 6 p.m. And the final one, which will be a little bit later to give people that hadn't had a chance to get to the, either the first three, will be Saturday, April 21st at the John Bryan Center at 2 p.m. So we thought that having different places, different times, different days of the week would really be a good way to enable people to attend. So what will happen at these meetings? We're still in <coughs> process of developing them, but what council has, and I suppose was on the council table, is a condensed version of um, the PowerPoint presentation that was given to Council on January 16th, I think. Mm -hmm. And we've been trying to winnow this down so that it can be delivered in 20, 25 minutes, still have time for questions about it, and still have time for discussions. So uh, what the, so the Yellow Springs, Ohio Housing Needs Assessment, and there's a lot of really good and important data in that. And um, I'm going to ask council uh, if they have any comments on that particular PowerPoint. Lisa has given me a few, um, but just to sort of continue and then I'll open it up for us. Uh, the other piece of the conversations will be one or more questions that citizens can address. So currently that discussion question reads, given the demographic and housing trends in Yellow Springs, what do you like and what would you want to see changed and why? So that, that's where this stands now. So these meetings will be facilitated by facilitators from the mediation program and uh, there will be an opportunity for people to break into smaller groups and then the conversations will be recorded. We'll have people there with flip starts recording them. That's the, the primary thing that the advisory group has been working on is to develop, get these meetings set up. So I'm going to open it up to council first. Do you have any feedback on the PowerPoint and the question? Um, I, have, I have just a couple um, and their majority are cosmetic, um, simply things like splitting one slide into just two to have less density of text on a slide so that we don't need to discuss that. I think the um, the most substantive comment I have has to do with the question. Um, when I read the discussion question, I said, given the demographic and housing trends in Yellow Springs, what do you like? And I said, about what? What do I like about what? The trends. Well, right. So I just feel like what, when you're getting someone to focus their thinking, what do you like, you know, what do you like about the trends or what are you concerned about the trends or 
you know, I just got a little bit worried about what do you like, would you and be what would you want to change? In, uh, uh, send it, shoot, thinking of what you would th think would be a better way of saying it and sending it to me. Sure. So, I won't change it much. It's close. Uh -huh. Do whatever you want. But. <laughs> so you're just about adding some words describing the trends that what you. No, no. I mean, it may be just turning the sentence okay. around to say. No, I don't want a word. Yeah, right we won't here. do it right now. If you, yeah, I'll send it to you. Okay, Kevin, did you have any comments? N nothing substantive. Um, how, this is what 18, 19 slides. How many? How large was the original? It's just 47 slides. Or something. No, I think 30. The, the original was 37, and it took us an hour and a quarter. And this is this is 19. Okay. So it's about half. It's an amazing job of cutting it down. Yeah. I have one other question. I'd like to thank Karen Wintrow, who, who did a lot of the working things to get it. Slide 15. Understandable. And the headline says many development sites exist in Yellow Springs. And I was like, really? Many? Many? I feel Because I feel like one of the things we heard is that we're... Well, 19. Is that many? I don't know. Well, we could scratch, scratch many. We could several, say several, a few. Nineteen. I mean, I just don't know. Yeah, like yeah. many is Wh was a funny one word. Which one is that? Nine, slide slide it's nineteen. The one with the map on it. I mean, the, 15, the page slide number. Slide fifteen. It's, uh, oh, slide fifteen. Um, the it, in. Oh, okay. I'm I'm right there. Because I feel like we're okay, I'm we're cross, constrained. I'm going to cross many. Okay. Not cross out many. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, I'm going to uh, discuss the other piece and then we'll open it up to the public for comments. The, um, one of the things that we have been, the Housing Advisory Board has been looking at is can we, uh, can we, how can we uh, enact uh, an inclusionary zoning code? Inclusionary zoning code says that any development and you can specify the size of the development, has to include a certain percentage of affordable housing. So uh, this has been effective in communities that are having the kind of issues we are having. And um, whether, so we've been researching, we've been talking to um, some uh, people in the field, and so far we have not been able to get the information we need to know whether it really is workable here, how long it would take to do it, who would help us do it. Um, so it's still up in the air. I'm going to open this up to the public. Anyone attending, do you have any comments? Questions and anything. I looked through this and I thought it was pretty good. Um, again, I'm looking for some numbers. Is the data based on census or the survey results or something else? Pardon? <laughs> it, it depends on which data you're asking about, really, Dave. I, well, some of it is from the census, other or from other different uh, different sources. I mean, a lot of it is from the census. Yes. I think does the original one have all that? It data? does. So you can go to. No, no, no. That that's well, the whole report. Right. I'm talking about the original PowerPoint. 37 page PowerPoint. Yeah. Well, I, I found that one online someplace on the. Website. I assume that's what you're talking about. Yes. Because I did some calculations and I came up with different numbers. Yeah, so well, that happens. That's why I'm yeah, it happens. Um, okay. Well, I, and, and there's a lot of confusion too about because people have asked me things about it says, for instance, that um, we expect to see an increase in X number of houses per year, and it's a general statement about overall. But then it gets into specifics about certain numbers of households um, increasing in other ones, and the numbers don't seem to jive. Well, what you have to remember is you're talking in one instance, you're talking about the entire population. In another instance, you're talking about a specific subset of the population. So keep in mind that if you're over here talking about you're going to add 26 homes, but now you're talking about you're going to have a 30-home increase in seniors um, 
65 to 74. Well, keep in mind that those who are 55 to 64 are going to age into that group. So you're not adding households, they're just transitioning from one age group to another age group. And so that, I think a lot of people, if, you ha if you're reading it, you need to stop and think about what specific portion of the population you're talking about or whether you're talking about an overall number for the entire population. And, and well, I agree, and that's yeah. what I'm trying to do, and I'm good at that, yeah. and I'm not finding the data, and so I'm puzzled. You know, mm -hmm. A little bit more quantification, mm -hmm. break down of some specific things. D finding, David? Like, how many affordable D houses are there? David, do we want? if you had specific questions, you could write them down, mm -hmm. send them to Patty, okay. and if we have the answer, we'll get it to you. Okay. Um, and if we don't, we'll get the answer, and then we'll get it to you. And certainly, the, I don't have the answer. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that if I think that defining some of these terms, like you've been talking about, mm -hmm. you know, would be helpful. It helped me, and it would be helpful to lots of people because affordability means lots of things. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually has been a topic of conversation yeah, uh, with the advisory board. And it isn't one thing either. Um, I think it would be really helpful to determine what the village government can and cannot do. Well, that's that's the next step. And we have, there are a number of things, and we have them in the queue to start looking at them. But, the, you know, we, we're sort of taking step by step. Okay, well, when you get to there, right? I yes, to later this year. Yeah, you know, and, and focus on the former and work with other people, but be really clear about it because I sense a big expectation that why did village government keep the mm. school tax lower? Mm. Okay. You know? So if you can define it even a little bit up front, you might be able to mm -hmm. end off some Point of that. taken, thank you. Yeah. Um, and um, I guess that answered some of the other ones. Where are on page 15? Unless it's just too small, it'd be interesting to know where those potential housing property development places are. Just you know, we didn't want to do that okay. because they're all private except for the glass farm. Oh, okay. And we we went back and forth about that, mm -hmm. but it seemed okay, better see. not to do that. But, but there is actually in the original Bowen PowerPoint a map with dots on it that shows you where you're at. And a list, and a list of the properties with their addresses. All right. Thank you. Thanks, David. Yes, Richard. Uh, Richard Lapini, Limestone Street. I would like uh, Council to consider not only the definition of affordability, but the goal, the affordability goal for the village. Do we want the entire village to be all affordable, or do we want a certain percent of housing stock to be affordable? And what is an optimum that's balanced? To have a balanced community. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That's Thank you. Yeah, and I yeah, see that's. I anticipate that we will be doing that. Thanks, mm -hmm. Richard. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Let's move on to the next thing, which is the revolving loan fund designated CIC discussion, which our solicitor is going to introduce. Well, I prepared a report, and uh, it lays out uh, generally what a CIC is. Um, and essentially, a CIC is an economic development tool. Um, and in the context of the revolving loan fund, um, as I understand the, the, at least the discussion that we're having, is that it would be uh, uh, funding to be available to uh, businesses who are just trying to start up. Um, the caveat is under Ohio law that for a revolving loan fund that the uh, individual the business must have attempted to at least get traditional financing through another entity. Now, we're not fin financing or, or putting that much money in the fund initially, but I think that in a larger discussion, um, one of the advantages that's perceived to exist for CIC is that it is, is a economic development tool that is more than just the revolving loan fund. So in the context of the village's discussion on economic development generally and how the revolving fund loan fund might fit as a larger piece of that, um, I simply presented the information to 
council to say this is a tool that's there. Now, if the council was only interested in doing the revolving loan fund piece of this, um, then I'm not sure that a, a, an economic, or pardon me, a CIC would necessarily make that much sense um, just for that limited piece. But in the context of a broader discussion um, and some of the advantages that may exist for a CIC, um, then I think that this uh, report gives some talking points for council to consider in a larger discussion. Well, my understanding, and I think it's Brian is the one who as the key on this is that it was brought up as an idea primarily because of the revolving loan fund and because there's something that the revolving loan fund can't do unless it's if it's administrated by the village well there, there was a discussion early on as to whether or not it would be possible to work through a credit union or somebody mm -hmm. would administer the fund mm -hmm. um, it, 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 when i was first asked that before i looked into any of this my reaction was i was uncomfortable um, with a, a partnership of that kind. However, in, since I've looked into the CIC, um, if a CIC existed, it is not an issue at all because a CIC is a private corporation. <coughs> um, we talked a little bit about the difference between dedicated versus non-dedicated, but as a private corporation, it can contract with third parties. That's one of the advantages. Um, however, um, in the context of a discussion with who a partner would be to administer a revolving loan fund, um, I think that we could probably arrange something because of the limited purpose um, and we could state within the context of the agreement that would be drafted that uh, it was being done as, as part of a, a, a pro bono or community service outreach program um, that would be something for the common good. And you know, frankly, if somebody wanted to complain about uh, a business that wants to provide uh, a service to the community, essentially no charge, I, I will cross that bridge when we get there. Um, well, we just had a CIC that dissolved itself. So the idea of creating another one is sort of bothersome to me. Uh, aside from the fact that I'm sure it would cost money at you know, creating a whole new board, whole new structure. Um, so I, I'm, I guess the idea came up through the Economic Sustainability Commission. So, you know, as a newcomer to Economic Sustainability, um, I think my understanding is that they they left it saying they couldn't move forward with the revolving loan fund without a CSC, CIC, particularly also because of some of the issues of confidentiality of information and if people are applying for a revolving loan and it comes in front of the council, it, it is all public information. So then everybody's business is just right out there. And so by having a CIC formed, then that can protect the confidentiality of people's financial details and things like that. And that that's, my understanding, is that's a, a key reason why something like that is ideal. But this is the first time I've heard that perhaps it would be okay to just use, you're saying yes, it would be okay for I'm a credit saying, union? I'm saying that we, kind of thing? I, we have to explore, okay, just at a general conceptual level, because that's where we are. When, when the, the question was first posed to me is, could it be possible? My reaction was, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, but it, again, if it's a standalone, because if you're talking, there's lots of economic development discussions that council is engaged in over time. And, and one of the key parts of this, and I can address this specifically in the report, because you can get bogged down in the details. I think we're at a high level here, so, is that for a dedicated CIC, Part of that has to be an identifiable, articulated economic development plan, which is part of that process that accompanies the Attorney General's review of the Articles of Incorporation. So a dedicated CIC is a part of a broad economic development plan, um, which includes, obviously, you've got the CBE land out there that is uh, available for commercial development. You've got the revolving loan fund that you want to talk about. Um, there is a, you know, there's a, there's a housing piece of this that could potentially play into it. So in the, that 
broad and large concept, I, I, I needed to raise this to the issue in a broad, to the council mm -hmm. in a broader sense. Um, however, if the conversation is now narrowly tailored to only the revolving loan fund, um, I can envision a path whereby perhaps we don't have to go down the CIC route. Um, although I will tell you, almost every community would go down that path for things that you've mentioned, Lisa. And because, again, it's, it is an economic development tool, and that's typically how it's done. There's also a belief, um, and I can't validate this by personal experience, but you know, the people who talk about it, is a dedicated CIC is an agent of the village. There might be avenues for grant money and other opportunities right. that may not be also available for a non-dedicated CIC. Which, which was one of the reasons specifically that the CIC was talked about was because of the hope of getting grant monies to add to the small pot that we have. So well, I, I would like to direct the Economic Sustainability Commission, which is who is the liaison? I am. You are. I would like council <laughs> to direct the Economic Sustainability Commission to write up um, a recommendation to come back to council to say either, you know, these are the things that we're proposing, like we have, we have an economic development plan, we have a, a revolving loan fund that's part of that plan, and these are the options that we see available to move those that plan forward and if a CIC a designated CIC is part of that then I'd like to see something that says th these are the benefits of the CIC this is what it would take to do to form it this is how much money it would cost you know these are the resources we'd need these are the pros and cons and these are other options mm -hmm. that could at least do some of the pieces I mean this is a big deal yeah. and uh, <coughs> when that's a significant new piece of work for that commission um, that hasn't been something they were focusing on they were focusing on the idea of a revolving loan fund but not the CSC which okay. they wow. saw as a responsibility of council so um, well, I'll let I'm you, we are meeting with them this month so um, I think uh, I can certainly talk with them about that I'm not sure that we have the skill set on the commission we might and I think we I, I would also want to um, check in with Brian because I think he has quite a bit of expertise and ideas about this as well so you know I, I we can talk about it that, I think that one of the challenges that, that, that would exist is that given a, 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 the size of the community yeah uh, you know, CICs typically are used for larger communities cities, not villages. Um, one of the things that one typically sees with CIC is a dedicated economic development director. <coughs> and so the question and one of the challenges that I, I think has historically existed within the village is who's the leadership, who, 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 yeah. who drives this economic yeah. development train? Um, obviously, um, we've had members of council who have been you know, dedicated to that and they're wonderful advocates for the, for the village, um, citizens themselves. But you know, sometimes it takes more than that. And there are distinct advantages to the CIC, but again, with um, I think that some of the things that you know, staff has many challenges in their time already, mm -hmm. um, and um, is there resources there to fund the position? Would it be necessary to fund the position? And it, is a, it, it would require a much more in-depth discussion. I mean, I think we could say, if we're going to have an economic development fund that has $30,000, which I think we're not going to create this monster CIC in order to manage thirty thousand dollars, but no. And if so. you told me, Chris, go figure out a way to make that work. <laughs> I can work with Patty and Melissa. We can find a way to probably. And, make and it there work. is a the records concerns, but I think that we can probably the, figure it out. The Green County does have a designated CIC. It's possible we could use that in some way. I mean, that's been brought up before, but I, I think. I'm done. <laughs> so, uh, I'm done. Uh, so I think it's a good idea um, for me to take that to economic sustainability and I'll report back at okay. whenever we can make the agendas work that I can report back on some discussion okay. on that. They may need to think about, you know. Yeah. yeah, this is not like a, okay, we'll 
we'll take an hour and figure this out. <laughs> yeah. Let's put on a show. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Does anyone in the audience, in any of our citizens, want to, to speak to this? Rich and Lapidus, I'm mindful of the three-minute rule. I wrote down what I was going to say because it's a little complicated, and uh, I'm going to try to keep it to about two and a half minutes. Brian Housh mentioned creating a dedicated CIC to me the other day, and I broadly mentioned it to a few others. My own, and I believe their own immediate reactions has been, have been very favorable. Why? It may address an obvious missing piece in our whole community's governance structures. Strategic planning for infrastructure investment. At present, our village council, township trustees, and school board each have key pieces of whole village infrastructure health and viability. Each separately proceeds to solve problems that naturally emerge from their slice of the whole. These problems emerge because no infrastructure lasts forever, and there is no cost-free way to sustain or improve them, an obvious but often underestimated effect. In any case, without consolidated planning, we often get unexpected and or suboptimal results from, tax, from the taxpayer's perspective. Lack of infrastructure planning results in divisive piecemeal competition for taxpayer money that, in turn, not only creates broad divisions in the community, it also makes for lengthy delays that make connect corrections much more costly. I believe that a DCIC may provide us with a solid forum with protocols to surface all our, to surface all our strategic needs and then prioritize them along, long in advance of actual investment. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say DCIC, I'm at living now. I uh, know a little, not enough about it. Uh, legally, but I believe it means that there must be elected officers in the majority of that board. Mm -hmm. I think so. Minority. 40 percent. Minority. I even thought it might be as high as 60 percent, which is my personal no. opinion. It can be because you can have a minimum of three members. No. You have to be cognizant of sunshine, though, I think, when you construct it, don't you? There, there are, is, the CICs are not subject to every aspect of the sunshine. So that's an interest. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I also believe no infrastructure should be allowed new investment unless the infrastructure management supplies us with detailed annual management schedules and budgeted operating costs for both existing and proposed components. Finally, another notion that Brian mentioned and I was immediately interested in is that a proposed DCIC should be the sole recipient of the Hope for Cresco Labs 2% a year contribution to the village's well-being. That new fund, which may be a, cons a considerable amount, would empower the DCIC with seed money for each infrastructure project. Putting all the fund into a DCIC will also prevent an unending food fight for operational supplements among the village's hundreds of nonprofits, big and small, in every domain. If council is the go-to place for extra money, it will be saddled with an owner's processing burden and constant competitive divisiveness. Their already difficult jobs will be sapped by the mind of the mind space and time space for everything else they do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So I'm going to and this is an interesting topic, an interesting conversation. Thank you, Richard, for bringing up the idea that a CIC could help our three governing bodies actually work together. Um, we need that. But Brian is a key player here, and Brian is not here. And uh, so I think we need to table this, leave the conversation, and we'll come back to it. Thank you, though. Yeah, but Mary, can I say one thing? I'm sorry. Yeah. You, you mentioned the cost of the formation. Mm -hmm. The actual formation of the CIC is simply creating a corporation, which is not particularly expensive at all. I mean, it, the formation could be if it were done streamlined and we did 
spare wheels in a lot of ways. Uh, they could be more, as little as $1,500. Um, okay, thanks. It could be $5,000. But I mean, in, in other words, yeah, I would not perceive the cost mm -hmm. to be prohibitive in moving forward mm -hmm. at that level. Thank you. All right. We are going to move on to the next topic, which is pool rate increase discussion. And Melissa is the lead on this. So in the packets, there should be a uh, current rate structure for the pool fees. And Judy, were we able to determine that 2009 was the last? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the ordinance in the packet is a 2012, but that added, I think, the... Um, Swimming for All program did not change the rate. So, in fact, the last rate increase was in 2009. That's right. Okay, so I just put the rates in there just so that council can see all of the current rates. And then what we were going to do was um, there was a walkthrough at the pool um, that Johnny Burns and Samantha Stewart, who's the pool manager, um, they, they performed that, I believe it was last week. And Patty and I are supposed to find some time um, to go up there and to take a look at the, uh, the situation at the pool and the repairs and try to get a schedule for some estimates and prioritize, uh, prioritize the repairs. I think that Samantha had put um, some of the repairs that are necessary into a 2018, 2019, 2020 mm -hmm. kind of a format. So we're going to get some, some costs uh, associated with those needed repairs. So these pool fees are just as a, a reference right now. We're working on the repairs piece, and then um, it, it was uh, expressed and has been for quite a while that we add an admission for um, an adult plus one child. So we would like to bring an ordinance back uh, with that information in the near future so that that would be in effect for this year's pool season. Did you have a rate that you were thinking of? Okay. Um, yes, actually I do have that rate. Um, it's in my email actually and I can't, I, I know it would take me quite a minute to find that here. So um, it would be, it would fall in between the uh, household and um, it was going to be in between the household and the adult. So I, I forget what that was. So it's between the 95 and the 125. I forget what that was. I think it was like 110 or somewhere in that range. Oh, I have a question. So the household rate, 125, then an additional member is 15 to the household rate. Mm -hmm. So if you have a household of six members, it would be 125 plus yes. 15. Mm -hmm. So, so adult plus one would be sort of the same as the 95 plus an additional member. Yeah, and we'd, 15, we would want to give them a little bit of a break on yeah. that, yeah. Okay. Um, comments? Um, I, I'm just mostly keen to understand what the costs are going to be because mm -hmm. I keep thinking, you know, we want to have this wonderful pool. Mm -hmm. We want people to be able to afford to go there. And then I'm just even wondering, I mean, how much would the rates have to go up to actually meet the expense needs? So, I mean, you know, it's not, it, I don't see those dots connecting, you know, so I think it's just going to be important for us to know it's one more aging. When would you anticipate having the um, Well, I'm, I'm hoping that possibly Patty and I can get there with Johnny maybe this week at some point. Um, and we can we can do the walk through because I know that Johnny has a number of, of safety concerns and of course safety is the utmost priority at the pool so he's a very he takes a very proactive approach with things so um, I, I believe that Samantha has the the priority list finished so we could look at what needs to be done in 2018 and get some of those estimates done so I'm hoping that if if Patty and I can go up there and take a look with Johnny and kind of get a game plan this week, then maybe we can start to get some contractors out and at least take some, you know, preliminary estimates. It might not be what the final costs are after we, you know, get more estimates for each individual project, but at least we would be able to get some sort of a baseline number within the next couple weeks. So by the next council meeting the ninth, on the 19th, would you be able to have 
I think that that might be pushing it because we're going to have to rely on contractors to come uh -huh. out and take a look at things. Mm -hmm. And we're not even sure, you know, if if we're going to have to have different contractors come out and, and address electrical and concrete and, you know, pool related um, equipment. Um, those are probably not going to be able to be quoted by one contractor. We'd probably have to have a couple different specialists come out and take a look. So we were we'd kind of be at the mercy of them and their schedules. And so my understanding is that if we were going to do a rate increase or or change, I guess. We would need to do it on the 2nd of April, and it would have to be an emergency ordinance? No, it would not need to be an emergency ordinance. Oh, ordinance no. At that time. And if I could just make a suggestion. Yes. Pools are like boats. You'll never make your money back. But if you had, <laughs> um, if you had a notion of what the rate structure could be to keep up with a high level of ongoing maintenance, which has not been the case in the past. If that were something that Melissa and Johnny could make a determination on, and that was used to look at rates, that makes a lot more sense than saying, oh my goodness, there's a, not, a lot that's not been done for the last number of years. We have a lot to catch up on. So if, if you folks were able to come up with a, in order to keep this in top running order yearly on a yearly basis, this is about what we need to spend. You're never going to get that from rates, but at least mm -hmm. you could you could hit the mark a little closer. Well, and if if at the same time we could have we could understand what revenue has been from people going to the pool. Mm -hmm. I have no. I mean, I I guess it's in the budget somewhere. Yeah. It is. But I don't think I zoomed in on that. So it's, it, the the pool the pool historically takes a bit of a loss. So it our current rates aren't even up to being able to meet the expenses of the pool and they haven't been since I've been here so it's just one of those things one of those you know recreational things that the village provides to the residents and I mean we we come close I mean but it's all weather dependent too so I mean yeah. if when we had it contracted out if there was a rainy day we still had to pay for we still paid a flat rate for that contract now that we've taken it back in house if we have a rainy day, we would see some cost savings from that kind of thing. But, you know, the nicer the weather, the more people come to the pool and enjoy it, and the more money it makes. So it's it's very weather dependent, too, which isn't really something that we can ever predict. No. So um, I, will, I will note, though, that um, I've talked to Johnny quite a bit about this because I know that he's really concerned um, about the number of repairs that are going to be need to be made. And, and we kind of talked preliminarily about where that funding might come from. And, the Parks and Recreation Capital Improvement Fund has had a, a pretty good chunk of money in there that I'm pretty confident, you know, we could at least earmark some of that to, towards the pool because, I mean, the pool's really the only need that I can foresee on the near future um, or on the horizon in the near future in order to, to kind of earmark, earmark some of those funds towards. So. Mm -hmm. There really aren't any other parks, projects that are even on anybody's radar except for the pool. So there is at least some funding there that we would be able to tap into. So would would you be able to have something for the April 2nd? I think that that would be much more doable. That would include the repairs that need to be made. Mm -hmm. And I think Judy was sort of alluding to some kind of annual capital improvement fund for the pool that we could anticipate and then also how much uh, revenue what the the revenue and expenses have been for say the last mm -hmm. yes i can do three that years or mm -hmm. so does that meet our needs that's great okay thank you now we're on new business <laughs> Okay, Lisa, it's yeah. back to you again. We've been talking a lot about finance and financial models and revenue and costs tonight, so we'll keep talking about that. Um, I'm bringing a proposal tonight to council um, that we would form a um, village manager advisory committee for finance. And uh, this is in consideration of the focus on affordability in the village. And uh, the work of this committee would be initially um, on investment protocols and on supporting uh, the cost budget analysis that a lot of these ideas that we have are going to require. So um, I, this committee initially would 
identify opportunities that optimize investment revenue while balancing risk to village assets. Certainly there's a lot of limitations of what we can do, but uh, there are some things. And then um, identify and propose cost saving measures. Um, the document outlines some tactics. I won't to read those to you. Uh, you can read them, have probably already. Uh, initial membership proposed is uh, Patty and Melissa and Brian Hausch and me. And uh, we anticipate that other participants with specific expertise, for example, investments, um, would be coming and uh, talking with us as needed. Uh, in the next couple of months, we'd like to launch and establish some data analysis, talk to some investment experts, and report um, back to council. Um, and then in May, um, identify if the scope of the committee is as it should be, and uh, prepare a recommendation for council about how to best approach finance and budget oversight moving for forward, whether it should be um, a village manager advisory committee or become uh, a committee to, of council that would have slightly different membership. So this sounds like it should have included um, the village treasurer or is this separate from that work? It's, or? it's separate. Yeah. And it, it's okay. it's sort of related because this the issue of the village treasurer is still kind of hanging out there, of you know who is that person. Mm -hmm. So if if there was that person and it wasn't any of these people, we would, you know, include that. But right now they're um, we're trying to make that decision about whether the current treasurer is going to remain in that role and yeah. So that's why that person's not listed here. Okay. I think that that person would be an advisory person. Mm -hmm. um, Melissa or Patty, do either of you have anything you want to? No, uh, Lisa um, did send us the proposal ahead of time and we, we did meet um, as a group one time just to talk about what this may potentially be and you know where it might go. Um, but Lisa did send us the proposal so that we could could review it. So. And is this one of our goal? Is this going to be discussed at our goal session? I I'm think I'm forgetting if this was a goal. Yes, it is to establish a, a finance, yes, some is. kind of finance committee commission. Yes. Is there anything else you want from council or staff right now? Um, no, just this? just whether or not you feel you know thumbs up or thumbs down. We'll press on. Well. I, yeah, I guess it seems good. I, if I can throw something in, just given that there are three of you where normally there are five, that it might not be a bad idea to bring a resolution on the matter. That way you've kind of got it bookmarked and you're bringing it back when all five of you are seated at the table. Well, I'm thinking that if we're going to be talking about it the, uh, at our planning session, that that's something that could come out of that discussion. Sure. And uh, uh, Brian is involved with this, right. so this has his mm -hmm. overview too. Okay, is there anyone in the, any citizen that wants to talk about this? Okay, now we're at the food forest proposal. The food forest proposal, um, as you can see from my for my little brief in the packet. Uh, Wendy Van Buren, is, she's an urban forester with the ODNR. She's a friend of mine, and, and uh, Wendy and I have been friends for, for many years. Uh, I mentioned to her when I was at some training that she was conducting that I was retiring, and so she wanted to, she said she wanted to do one more project together. So I wanted something that um, would give back to the community, and so um, I would like to propose to council that um, you allow Wendy and I to um, design and install, uh, along with some help from the tree committee who have agreed to help, a food forest at the Xenia Avenue and Allen Street Park. Um, and you can see some of the, 
the possible species that we could put in there, some ramps, pawpaws, persimmons, pecans, serviceberry, hickories, sassafras, plum, wild plums, hazelnut, and raspberries. Um, and if, uh, if this is a, uh, something that council is interested in uh, us moving forward with, it would be something that Wendy and I would work on together and uh, perhaps we could get uh, some donations from some members of the community. I would certainly make a donation myself personally and, um, and try to create this food for us. It would be free for everyone. Um, uh, even the critters would get to eat what drops on the ground and they, everybody would be happy. But it is safely accessible. There are sidewalks down Xenia Avenue to that point as well as up Allen Street to that point. Um, so it's safely accessible and, and people would just be able to go and maybe pick some berries and some wild plums and some nuts. And so the two of you would design the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Design. Would you need any help like from the Environmental Commission? Absolutely, if the Environmental Commission would like to be involved in it. Um, that's, that's perfectly fine with me. I mean, um, you know, I haven't priced the stock yet or anything, um, but um, you know, I'm, I'm, I would like to get some nice size stock so it doesn't take years and years to go uh -huh. into something that, that folks could use. Um, but I think it, it addresses a need for some fresh, some fresh fruits maybe at least and, uh, and uh, you know, maybe some nuts and sassafras is always good. You can do a lot of different things with sassafras. But uh, I think this would be a, a good project for Wendy and I to collaborate on as well as something that the community could use if council is Sounds cool to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. It's kind of a sad little plot right now there. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, the problem is it holds a lot of water, mm -hmm. as everyone knows. And, and so it makes it not great for planting some things, but it makes it pretty good for planting other things. So uh, we'll, we'll see what we can come up with in the design. And uh, I, I did meet with the tree committee, and, and they're on board and willing to help out. And so. So it contributes to the climate action plan. Too. It does. It does. So great. You guys want to do a Thank motion you. to approve? So she's got. Oh, sure. Uh, someone make a um, motion I, to approve. I, the I move to approve that uh, tree forest is established at that corner of Zini and Allen. Did I get I, that right? I, you did, and I second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. You got it. Now nominations. I'll do mine. This is quick. Your list might be bigger than mine. So okay, um, everyone has in their packet uh, a letter from Cindy Shaw. Um, <clears throat> we met with Cindy. Uh, Cindy is interested in being on the uh, Human Relations Commission, and so we've met with Cindy, and uh, she seems excited. So I'd like to nominate Cindy um, as a member of the Human Relations Commission. Yeah, and I, um, I met with Kevin. I've known Cindy for a long time. She's a retired, or at least semi-retired, semi I guess, uh, counselor. Seems very interested in being on RTSC. I think she'd be a good addition. So. I second. <laughs> okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Yeah, I, this is sort of like not really a, uh, a nomination, but um, I met with uh, Jerry Sims. He's interested in being on the community access panel. Um, so he makes three. Um, and so the, the panel is on hiatus right now. So we're looking at what we want to do with that and maybe um, considering changing its role, maybe doing a little something different, maybe doing a uh, village manager's advisory board with, with fewer people than different uh, wider of, focus wider thank you that's a good one wider focus different sets of restrictions so I just want to acknowledge uh, that Jerry Sims did apply and that we did talk to him and um, you know if we end up going in that direction in terms of uh, reinitiating the community access panel I would on a future date nominate him but just want to acknowledge uh, his desire uh, to so do that. are you going to start meeting with this core group is that or what you don't know? To be determined. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, any, are you I done? I think I am done. And speaking of Jerry Sims, <laughs> um, 
uh, Jerry Sims uh, indicated an interest in um, joining the Economic Sustainability Commission. Kevin and I interviewed him. Obviously, Jerry Sims needs no introduction, I don't think. So I'd like to make a motion that Jerry Sims join the Economic Sustainability Commission. I'll second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Um, uh, it seems to be my uh, call in the last uh, couple of weeks to interview formal, former council people to join commissions. We had Karen Wintrow. It's been funny for me to interview these people. You know, I'm interviewing Karen. <laughs> Yes. You know, now I'm interviewing Jerry, and then I also interviewed John Booth, yes. <laughs> who indicated an interest in joining the Justice System Task Force, and uh, uh, Judith and I interviewed him, and uh, I would like to make a motion that John Booth join the Justice System Task Force as a commission member. Okay. I second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. That's all. Okay. Sorry. Great. Now we're at the manager's report. We are at the manager's report. Um, you can see my report is very brief. I would like to pull uh, one thing out of the report, um, the gov deals. Um, Johnny and the crew have been cleaning up around Sutton Farm, uh, finding pieces of equipment that we maybe haven't used in some time, that we don't no longer have a need for. Um, so we've put a lot of things on gov deals. Um, and as you can see there, uh, when all is said and done, and, and these pieces are almost all picked up and paid for, we will net $41,800 for surplus equipment that we have sold. And the most notable one, I really want to point this one out, is um, if you remember, um, and, and Kevin and Lisa, I don't think you were here yet, but Johnny came to council when we were doing the budget and spoke to the need for a new bucket truck. Um, the, the dealer that we were uh, working with on the new truck said that they would give us 15000 as a trade-in on the old truck, and we sold it for 30500 on gov deals. So um, that was like a home <coughs> run right there for, right. for Johnny. So kudos to uh, them for that, as yeah. well as the wonderful job they've been doing downstairs in the rec center. If you guys haven't noticed the bright new... Uh, blue paint with yellow trim down there. Go take a gander at it, and we are just now waiting for the orange floor to be installed. Mm. So it will be bright, cheery colors for the kids down there. Mm. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to note is that I did finally sign the contract for the crew quarters today. Yeah. So they will be breaking ground on the new crew quarters very soon. Thank you. Lots of good news. That's good. Melissa. Okay, I'm going to do this backwards. Um, one of the things that I have noticed that we do not have in our ordinances for our utilities is a continuity of service clause. Basically what that is, and um, I've been doing some research on other other utilities, and it's, it's basically just a statement that says that the village will make reasonable provisions to provide continuous service of electric, water, sewer, things like that, but that we would not be responsible in the event of natural occurrences or accidents or anything like that. It's just kind of a, a, a statement that's just put in there to say we're, we're going to do our very best, but sometimes we can't, we can't prevent um, natural occurrences from happening or accidents which may uh, delay your service or um, disrupt your service for that reason. So I would like to bring an ordinance uh, update before council where we are able to include that continuity of service clause in a, at a future meeting. So if council is okay with that, we can look okay to put that, that. Like on move. a future agenda. Yep. Okay, and then the next thing, um, which I'm sure everybody's been hearing about, is the utility billing updates. So what happened was we finally switched over to our new utility billing so software. Um, it was converted on Monday the 26th, and it was the same day that our billing was done. And we knew that there would probably be a few hiccups, um, and, and there were. Um, there were a few, and everybody is going to get a letter. It was mailed out today. We did a, we did a separate mailing so that every customer is going to get this exact same explanation uh, to the mail, and um, those should be received tomorrow. So this, this letter that was sent out, it, the information is also posted on our website as well. I also put it on Facebook. 
So there were just a few small things. Um, the, the thing that caught most people's attention was now our charges are, are broken down and itemized. And I would have liked to have been able to let people know that that was happening before it did, but in order to get an insert into the utility bills, we have to have that a few weeks prior to the actual bill going out. So we weren't sure if we were going to be able to make it happen or not, and we were so excited to be able to add that additional layer of transparency that we went ahead and did it, and it alarmed a couple of people. So, um, a couple, mm -hmm. a few. So, all of those charges that you see on your utility bills have always been a part of your utility bill. It was just an effort for us to be more transparent because a lot of the questions that we get are people that want to be able to calculate their own utility bill and there are a number of different charges that go into that. So this was something that we just wanted to provide our customers with in an effort to be transparent. So these were not new charges, they've always been there. It's just now you can see them. Um, and then we also had an issue where um, we have some customers that are no bills on garbage, which means that they do not receive our trash service for a number of different reasons. So renters in apartment complexes, businesses that may have dumpsters, um, they, they do not, they are able to get their own trash service outside of the village's trash service. So those customers uh, received garbage bills in error and we have mass adjusted those off as well. So we, we, we were able to identify that very early on and fix that. Um, and we also had some issues with some history coming forward um, on the bill. It's in the system, but we did not have, uh, you know, the, the history graph that was normally on the bill. It wasn't on there. Um, any previous payments or previous balances weren't listed, but they are in the system. So I know that the bill kind of kind of looked um, a little different and it's caused a lot of questions with people, but the, the transition went pretty smoothly. Um, this, the new system is really nice. Um, we knew that there would probably be hiccups because there was, there's so much information to come over because we've never, we've never um, done any kind of uh, mass um, scrubbing of old accounts or anything. I mean, we've got data in that system from, from 30 years ago. So we have a lot of history that came over. So um, I just want anybody that has questions to just give give the office a call and we're, we're doing our best. Um, but like I said, everybody's gonna get a detailed uh, letter explaining everything that I just said in the mail tomorrow, hopefully. So that's I'd it. like to just say something about that. Uh, just wanna commend Patty. Uh, she was at the, uh, she's the uh, staff member, Patty Bates is the staff member that's assigned to a responsible for the uh, Human Relations Commission. And during the HRC meeting last week, um, everybody was alarmed uh, about this and she, she talked everybody off the ledge. <laughs> she explained all these things and it was very, I, I didn't know, but it was very informative and very helpful and I just wanted to share that. So thank you, Patty. Thank you. Sure. And thank you, Melissa. Yeah, thank I, you. And, and, and I want to commend Melissa and her uh, ladies down in the utility office. It's been a difficult week last week for them, and um, they have done an incredible job um, trying to get the word out. I mean, as Melissa explained, uh, we're just trying to make it more transparent, and um, they have done a wonderful job down there of, of talking to folks and, and spreading the word and, and making sure that everybody understands what they're looking at. So. Hmm. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> That's so true. It's happened a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> true. <laughs> well, thank oh. you for the report, Melissa, yes, and I look forward you. to getting my letter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the chief already is out of here. Unless. Do, 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 okay. She's okay. here to answer your questions if you have any. Oh man, we got to ask her something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she's perfectly happy to sit there and not have a not question. Have to okay. Solicitor, does the solicitor have anything else to I say? I think you've heard enough for me to see. Yeah. Okay. The clerk. I really don't have anything at all unless wow. you have any questions about the things that were in the packet. Okay, so. great. So let's move on to future agenda items. 
First, as said before, we have our next meeting on March 13th, Council work session. Council is supposed to have any comments that we want to make in terms of having getting into the goal written statement by the 8th to Brian, I assume. No, to me. Pardon? To, to me. you. Okay, to Judy. Great, okay. So I would like to go over the agenda for the March 19th meeting. I know one thing we added was bringing back uh, Judy, you, you thought you could have the council guideline mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. so that would be added. Um, and then it looks like we have Planning Commission annual report. I know that Denise has created it, so I assume she's good to go. Economic Sustainability Commission, do you know whether that will be ready? So um, I might need, I, I, I won't say I might, I do need some advice. So does that have to come, does that have to come to the commission and then wait until they bring it back in and vote it in before it comes to the? Sure. It's generally prepared by that commission. Yeah, Usually it, the chair prepares it. And mm -hmm. So if everyone so. agrees with it right then and there, it can come on ahead? Yeah. Yeah, I think that mine will be ready then. Okay. I'll know this week. If not, I can, I'll let, uh, let Judy know. The Environmental Commission annual report will be ready. Um, arts and culture. Will be ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that means we have one, two, three, four annual reports. And how much? About, about three, three minutes. We're seeing mm -hmm. three to five. Three. Do you okay. like to have We're the have um, uh, commission chair come and present it? That's generally the the way that it's been done. Yeah. So that I'll I'll verify that they're available. That might be also a gating factor. And then of course, as you do with the board and commission reports now. So if the if the report's in the packet, which means it gets <clears throat> to me by the Thursday prior to, then really that person is hitting the highlights. Um, anything they really think the public or council that should be pulled out and and really presented that does not need to be read through as a, mm -hmm. you know, the whole thing. That's the only way you're going to make the three to five minute mark. Thank you. Good point. Okay. Um, housing initiative update. Fees for event services. Mm -hmm. Are there recommendations or just? There are recommendations. Oh, good. Okay. I like that. Then uh, we'll have a resolution for the council goals. Uh, taser policy, do you know if that's ready to? Ready, isn't it? Yeah, we've, we've come to an agreement. I, I, are you right? I'm assuming you're writing the legislation. Uh, I will. <laughs> Chris is writing that legislation. Okay. And, um, I believe we're doing that by resolution. Yes. yes. Oh. Uh, ordinance uh, ordinances for mobile vending trucks that that's not something that should take much time so is there anything else that would be on the March 19th agenda well I okay. just wanted to add that I will not be present oh, at that oh, meeting. okay um, did you want to give Melissa a time frame for that ordinance for the continuity of services clause piece do you want to shoot for April 2nd since you don't have? Well, okay. Actually, you're going to have a honk load of stuff no matter what because all three of those other ordinances come back and then you've mm -hmm. got new ones added. So it's your call. Can, it's a honk load either can way. Can we put it down on the 16th as a first read? Or mm -hmm. you, okay. Yeah. Maybe, um, and the other thing that I had was bringing back the. Uh, information on the revolving loan from the ESC, if that's going to be ready. Well, that, that, mm. that, well, you'll know. Yeah, I'll, I'll know, I'll, I'll, I need to meet with them. It looks like the second is pretty jammed up. Mm -hmm. A lot of that's legislation. It shouldn't take go quickly. Huge amounts of time. Yeah. yeah. Well, why don't just to keep that moving forward? Um, so that's we should call that the CIC old business. Yeah. Yeah, and it 
and so the 19th will be the time when we do our commission reports. Of course, a lot of the commissions are doing their annual report. It's their annual report, yeah. So I don't want to put them on the spot to have to talk about a CIC when yeah. they're talking about their annual report and they will just have heard about this. So, so I'd rather come back on the second. Okay. <coughs> with CIC as an agenda item. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. And then on the second as well, you want to uh, put in the pool repair cost estimates mm -hmm. information. Did you want that as a separate report with legislation? Um, I don't think we need legislation I for mean, that. The legislation for the. Oh well, yeah, we could do that at the same time. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, I think I I want to make sure that we don't drop the ball to also hear back from HRC about the idea of potentially getting involved with the utility piece as well. Um, HRC meets the first Thursday, so. Mm -hmm. So that would be, would that be the 16th then? Yes. That, that that would go yes. to? Yeah. Because yeah. April 1st is a Sunday, it's Easter Sunday. So HRC won't meet until after the meeting on the 2nd. So it would be April 16th before you. Mm -hmm. So if we could put the utility affordability as a old business on the 16th, and that could include both the thoughts from the HRC and progress with the finance side of it too. An update? All right, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're ready to wrap up this show. And we're not having an executive session, are we? Correct. Correct. Okay, so do, we ha do I have a move to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. All right, a new record has been established. I don't know.